Hi, my name is Nancy Vereker, and um, I feel like I'm at a big open meeting. I have had the uh, gift and blessing of recovery for the last 28 years, and um, it's really a pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, it's kind of overwhelming to stand here in front of everyone and um, think back to uh, a year ago. I was praying about this book, which I had been working on for four years with our son, JP, who uh, has more than eight years sober and is co-founder of a treatment program. And uh, the fact that it was such a painful time in our life before that, but I knew that uh, together, JP and I had a beautiful message of recovery to share, generational recovery. And I was on a retreat team down in Florida praying about trying to find a publisher for the book and was about to self-publish which would have meant taking money out of my youngest daughter's college fund to pay for it. But we were committed. My husband was behind it. And um, Teresa Nipper was part of the recovery team, uh, the uh, retreat team. And at 6 o'clock in the morning, she had come in from a morning swim. And I was just getting up because I like to sleep. And Teresa gets up early. And Teresa was wrapped with a towel around her with this cute little bathing suit. She was dripping wet. And she had heard me just briefly mention in the talk the night before that I had we our family had gone through this uh, you know, addiction crisis, and she walked up to me and said, um, I'm going to tell my husband about you. He has a publishing company, and he's going to get in touch with you. And I was like, oh, my gosh. I, I couldn't, because I had been praying very hard and was very discouraged. And the next morning at, like, 7 o'clock, I get a call from Jim Nipper. So I owe Jim a huge, Deacon Jim Nipper, a huge debt of gratitude for bringing our story forth and bringing it into the world. I really... <laughs> So you've, you've all heard a lot of statistics this morning, and I would just say that we, our family of my husband, myself, three daughters, and our son, our son was the identified person as the addict, so the, uh, the five of us were the shadow figures surrounding him, and uh, our lives, you know, with his were going down the drain uh, eight years ago, uh, well, yeah, eight years ago, and JP's story began when he was about, he had a he was depressed in eighth grade, and then in high school, he really, his addiction and use took off. Now, I, I want to say, and, and just for the record, um, that, you know, we were, if you looked at a Christmas card picture of our family, um, I was a parish council president. I worked as a spiritual director. I'm a youth minister at my parish. My husband is, has a wonderful business he works hard at. Our three daughters are lovely girls, and our son was this great guy who was struggling. But we were one of the families in the pews. And, and I will add also that my pastor, I went to confession before I went out with the nippers to the religious educators uh, conference. And I went to confession because I like to go to confession where I travel. And it was just when the book came out. And my pastor, who was my boss, um, was like, I didn't know about this. I had no idea. When did you write the book? When did this all happen? And I had known this guy for a number of years. But we kept it completely under wraps for the shame of it. And for the shame of it and for protecting our family and for um, just for the shame. Because at, at the height of it, at the worst of it, I really believed that I had no business being a mother to four beautiful children. I had no business working in my parish with teenagers. I had no business doing anything but sort of sitting in looking at the walls of my kitchen saying, what the hell happened here? Excuse my language, but that was really the question. OK, let's, let's, not, let's not sugarcoat this. And ultimately, uh, after rehabs, after um, too many detoxes to count, my son was in a blackout, I think, for a couple years. So we have a disagreement. I say, JP, you went to about eight detoxes. And he says, there was five. And I said, I'll get the bills for the eight, JP. <laughs> you know, but after, like, after we had our son arrested, we had a court order of protection brought against him. At, we put him out of the house when he failed out of high school, and he lived in a Y. And we did let him back in. That was the last time. And our message is really one of a family that loved each other very much and was struggling mightily every day to save the mm -hmm. son, the brother, the grandson, the nephew, the friend that everyone knew and loved. I will be very honest to say this, this thing took out my marriage for a lot of time, and I adore my husband. But it, it, it 
brought us to our knees in our marriage. It brought our daughters to places of struggle, anxiety, difficulty with their schoolwork when we were trying to protect them. It brought our son to very dark places. But ultimately, because we sought professional help, and I mean a lot of professional help, and we hired and fired a lot of people too. Because there are people that will come and they just want you to write the check and they'll give you a lot of BS, okay? And we ultimately put together a team, and one of them was a doctor at St. Vincent's Hospital in Harrison, New York, and he began to work with me for 18 months, I went to see that guy about getting a court order protection and, getting, and putting our son out. Because to do that to my son, my JP, my who I call my Manzo in the book, it's his nickname, was inconceivable. And every mother is hardwired to protect and not to like walk away. But the whole thing kind of, the best way I could say it is on uh, Christmas Day, uh, it, nine years ago, um, our son called us. He was homeless. He was, we hadn't seen him for almost a year because we cut ourselves off from him after his last relapse. We weren't going down to Florida for family programs or for trips to prop him up, and we weren't letting him come home. And on Christmas Day, he called my husband and I at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and asked us to wire him $21 so that he could have something to eat. And I previously had a phone call a couple days before with a man who was a mentor to my son and had helped our family. And he said to me, Nancy, do you want to be a loving mother? And I was crying, sobbing in the phone, because this thing was getting to me. I was, I was really at my wit's end. And I said, of course I want to be a loving mother. And he said, don't send him a dime. Don't give him a dime, because he'll use it to buy drugs. And so on that Christmas day when he called and our daughters were in the, in the house waiting to have dinner with us because we were trying to keep it together for them. And we were in my husband's office, which was across the driveway. And my husband was a lot stronger than mine. JP was on speakerphone and J Joe just said, JP, we're not sending you any money. If you want treatment, we'll, we'll help you get into treatment. But we're not doing anything for you today and we love you and we're praying for you. And hung up the phone. And after that, Honestly, it got easier, and that was towards the end of it. But it got easier because I, I understood that my role as a parent and that the most loving thing I could do for my son was to love him without us being around and to let him make his own choices about this. And it was a risk, okay? It was a risk. But my son was going to die either way. My son was going to die. And when you read the book, which the book is powerful, uh, we've been told it's powerful, because you hear this, the voice of the addict. It's not just me like, everyone knows what that sounds like, okay? But it's my son saying, explaining what he did. And he was so gracious to agree to, to break his anonymity and, and be part of the book. I, I give my son so much thanks for that. But finally, um, uh, three months later, uh, our son called my husband. My husband was up. We have a cottage in Rhode Island. The pipes had broken. My husband was cleaning up a plumbing mess. And he called my husband, and we were in New York. I was in New York with my daughters. And um, my son said, uh, Dad, I've, I've been arrested. I need you to come bail me out. Come help me. And my husband hung up the phone on him and said, you're on your own. And that night at 10 o'clock, my, my son collect called me, and it said it was a collect call from a jail in Florida, because my son had gone to treatment in Florida and had gone back to Florida. And um, uh, this friend who had spoken to me on the phone at Christmas drove by, JP was released on his own recognizance, he was sitting outside, and the friend said, you can get in my car and I'll take you to treatment or you're gonna sleep on the beach because everyone's walked away from you. And um, that was the beginning of my son's spiritual awakening. Um, and, and he gets all the credit with God for what he did. Um, I will say that writing the book, it's beautiful to be here in a Catholic setting because I couldn't help but write the book from a Catholic perspective as my faith, uh, is such an important part of my life. The, the uh, spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola, desolation and consolation, we were in a desolation. We lived in a desolation, I lived in a desolation. And those, that helped me, and the rosary helped me, and friends who I trusted helped me, and people who didn't judge us, because that was the thing I was so afraid of, was people were going to judge that we had failed, and that we were this family, and we had, we had totally screwed up. This thing's genetic, this thing's brain chemistry, this thing's environmental, this thing is any millions of things, and I don't ask myself anymore why it happened, because I learned in the rooms, what won't help you. It, it, I, and I told a group of parents I spoke to last week in Rockland, they were trying to put it, I said, it doesn't matter why, 
It just matters what decision you're gonna make today to be in a solution. And, and, and you have to take care of yourself. And, and the, the biggest thing like, is to, to seek professional help with people who are sympathetic, compassionate, but proactive addiction specialists. Because going and working with that man helped me, as did the 12 steps, as did my beautiful husband, as did praying the rosary at two o'clock in the morning. Because for about six years, we didn't sleep. We didn't sleep. And it was at 2 AM, I'd say, Joe, and he'd say, We've done everything we can. And then I'd grab my rosary beads, just as you did. Um, I, I wish I could say my parish offered something. I mean, here I'm sort of like in the middle of my parish doing stuff, but um, they didn't at the time. And, and I hope I can bring some wisdom back to our parish and, and help other families. Um, I, I, don't, I don't really know. Am I? Two minutes, okay. <laughs> I'm at the two minute mark. Um, I don't wanna go over because I, I wanna, everyone needs a chance to share their story. I, I just uh, would say that, you know, Mother Teresa talks about, you know, the beginning of change is to pick one body up off the street, you know? If every person here today could just help one mother or one father, even if you didn't help the addict themselves, Dr. Cipriano worked with me and by working with me, it began, then it, Joe got it, then my daughters got it, because we used to go eight o'clock on a Saturday morning and uh, work with Dr. Cipriano, and our, our younger daughter was home, and my daughter's now husband was watching her, and we didn't know who did the harder work, like taking care of Grace, jumping on a trampoline at eight o'clock in the morning, or like working with Dr. Cipriano. But if you just work with one person, a grandmother, a friend, just one person will begin to in, in, impact this entrenched family system. And, and, and just tell them, don't, don't feel guilty, don't feel bad, don't be ashamed. Just come out and want, roll up your sleeves and do some change. Because as your eminence said, it, you know, one of the slogans I always love is change or die. You know, nothing changes if nothing changes, but the one that always hit me in the face was change or die. And it's change that has to happen, painful change. And for me, a lot of times the barometer was when Dr. Cipriano would tell me something I didn't want to hear with love, but I didn't want to hear it, I knew that was the thing I had to move towards. And when he said I had to get a court order of protection against my son, I knew that was my truth. It just took me a while to get there. Anyway, I hope you enjoy the book. It, it's kind of blowing me away to see it on the table. <laughs> like. <laughs> If, if you knew how hard we prayed and how my husband didn't have clean laundry for the last few months, I was, and then I'd be like, JP, would you answer my phone call? I need one question. You know, if, if you knew the whole thing, it, it would be very funny. But um, anyway, we, our family motto is we put the fun in dysfunctional. That, that is, you know, so, so anyway, there is always hope for recovery. I'll be over here with beautiful Deacon Jim Nipper. I have some business cards. I will answer emails. I really want to return the gift that God has given me with my marriage, my family, my daughters, and my son. God bless your work. Thank you very much.